I'm Sarah Morehouse from the Empire State College Online Library. This is the fifth unit in our series of videos about evaluating information sources for research and everyday life. In this unit, we talk about objectivity, what it is, why it's important, how to decide if an information source is objective or not, and what to do about it. Objectivity means knowledge that can be reality checked. The ways that we do this reality checking are observation, deduction, and experimentation. In contrast, subjectivity means knowledge or understanding that is internal and personal, and varies from individual to individual. An example is the Rorschach test, in which a person looks at an ink blot and tells the psychologist what image they see. There is no actual image in the ink blot. You see what your psyche predisposes you to see. Our senses are not perfect, and our feelings and expectations affect how we perceive things in every area of life. I want to show you a clip from a talk by astronomer Dr. Deborah Harzma. That the results of science are reliable at all? Well, science works as a community. There's people from all these different philosophical views working together. In my scientific work, I've worked with people with many different belief systems, and yet we can work together um, because we share a similar value of the worth of this kind of investigation and a similar belief that nature operates by regular repeatable patterns that are open to human investigation and a similar belief that we have to do experiments and observations to test our ideas and we can't just uh, guess at what's there and assume it's right. So if all these scientists from all these different viewpoints can get together and come to the same conclusion, that gives you some sense that that's probably on the right track and it's not being biased and it's not being uh, subject as subjective. It's a correcting process. Uh, Dr. Harzma says nature operates by regular repeatable patterns that are open to human investigation and we have to do experiments and observations to test our ideas and we can't just guess at what's there and assume it right. That right there is the basis for objectivity. An objective fact is a fact that is testable. Maybe we don't have a conclusive answer one way or the other, right now, but you can formulate it as a hypothesis that can be proven or disproven. And another important bit is that no matter who is doing the testing, as long as they all have the same conditions set up and don't bias the testing, the answer should turn out the same. That means that it's both testable and replicable. Why is this important? Dr. Harzma hints at it when she says, if all of these scientists from all of these different viewpoints can get together and come to the same conclusion, then that gives you some kind of sense that you're on the right track. Scholarly research values objectivity because it's a way for people with different experiences and interpretations to come together and figure out what actually works in the real world. There's a Hindu parable that illustrates it. A number of blind men came to an elephant. Somebody told them that it was an elephant. The blind men asked, What is the elephant like? And they began to touch its body. One of them said, It's like a pillar. The blind man had only touched its leg. Another man said, The elephant is like a husking basket. That person had only touched the elephant's ears. Similarly, he who touched its trunk or belly talked of it differently. There are many different things in life that are too vast, too microscopic, or too complicated for each of us to know directly. Each of the blind men had an incomplete and distorted perception of the elephant, but it's possible that by talking to each other and checking their ideas against each other and testing those ideas by going back to the elephant, they could put together a representation of the elephant that was much closer to the objective reality. In everyday life, we talk about facts versus opinions. Facts are objective. Opinions are not. They're subjective. Two people can hold conflicting opinions on a subject, and you can't really say that one of them is right and the other one is wrong. My opinion is that olives taste nasty. You may love olives. There's room for disagreement because your taste buds and your mental associations with the flavor are completely different from mine. The experience of tasting an olive varies from person to person. It's subjective. An important thing to keep in mind is that subjectivity foregrounds the individual who has the beliefs or feels the feelings. Now if you said that olives were a fruit that grows on a tree, and I said olives were pickled fish kidneys, 
Well, it really doesn't matter what either of us thinks, because we know how to go out there and prove one of us is right and the other one is wrong. With objectivity, the individual who is doing the observing or experimenting is kept out of the picture. What is foregrounded instead are the objects or concepts being studied. So the big thing about objectivity is that its claims are backed up with evidence. That means two people with different opinions, as long as they're not being stubborn and unreasonable about it, can come to an agreement on a topic, because the real world itself demonstrates what is correct and what is incorrect. This is in contrast to subjectivity, which is an entirely internal sense of good and bad, right and wrong, desirable and undesirable. Objectivity is what author Philip K. Dick means in his quote, Reality is that which doesn't go away when you stop believing in it. You find a way to detach from your beliefs, emotions, and attitudes long enough to form a hypothesis, test it through experiments or observations, and deduce your conclusions with rigorous logic. This is true in the hard sciences, but it's also the ethos that shapes the social sciences. And while humanities subjects don't really do experimental research, they require their scholars to detach from their subjective experience and use observation and deduction just the same. Now I've said that objective claims are based on reality because they can be tested against reality, but a claim can be testable and also incorrect, like when I said that olives are pickled fish kidneys. The history of human knowledge is also the history of human error. In the 17th century there was a theory that had quite a large following among scientists called phlogiston theory. Phlogiston was supposed to be a substance that burnable objects contained and that was released by fire. When the phlogiston was used up, the fire went out. It wasn't just folklore. The scientists developed the theory by making hypotheses and testing them in fairly well-designed experiments. The theory did a good job of explaining how fire burned, how iron rusted, and how animals turned food into energy. But it was still wrong, and they finally figured that out in the mid-18th century when an experiment showed that magnesium actually gains weight as it burns which means it couldn't possibly be losing this hypothetical phlogiston substance. It took scientists, using every objective tool at their disposal, almost till the 19th century to figure out oxidation, which is how those processes actually happen. So being objective does not guarantee that something is correct. It's just that objectivity is the only good way to move forward in figuring out what is correct. You can have an objective claim that isn't supported with enough evidence. It could be either correct or incorrect, but there's no way to tell without that evidence. However, if an information source makes a claim and doesn't support it with evidence, chances are it's not a very strong claim. Because why would an author leave out good evidence if they had it? For example, one theory about the fall of the Roman Empire is that it was caused by lead poisoning. Lead causes behavior and cognitive problems. The Romans used lead in their cookware and wine goblets. It sounds plausible, but it just leaves too many open questions. Is there evidence of lead poisoning in the archaeological remains of Romans? Actually, they had lower levels of lead in their bones than their European neighbors. Is there documentary evidence that the Romans saw a rise in cognitive and behavioral problems? Aside from their notoriously wacky ruling family, not really. And furthermore, there's documentary evidence that the Romans knew about the dangers of lead poisoning and went out of their way to avoid it. Are there other factors that could explain the fall of the Roman Empire better? Plenty. There were economic problems, internal conflicts, and external wars. Plus, the leadership was terrible. This just goes to show that if a researcher or scholar uses objective methods but doesn't take them far enough, their conclusions may not be any good. Finally, you can have what looks like an objective statement, what might have been an objective statement, except they embedded an opinion in it. It's the difference between saying last summer was hot, which is something you can back up with facts, versus last summer was too hot. You can't prove too hot. It's a subjective interpretation. It doesn't belong in an objective statement. When you put it in there, you're hijacking the strictly informational purpose of the objective statement, instead making it an attempt at persuasion. You'll hear this in editorials and political speeches. It shows up in the news media, although it's not supposed to. Once in a while, it will even sneak into a scholarly information source, despite the value the scholarly community puts on real objectivity. 
Here's a question. Does the color purple look the same to everyone? I started wondering about this when I was a little kid because my dad is colorblind. The answer seems to be, no, everybody gets the same purple wavelengths hitting their eyeballs, but it looks different because everyone's sense organs and brain and the experiences that we associate with things are unique. So I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't remind you that there are people who claim there is no such thing as true objectivity. They have a point because whatever exists outside our own skulls, we will never be able to perceive it except through our senses and interpret it with our minds. Even when we try to back up claims with evidence and test our hypotheses, those methods and rules and standards are interpreted by our minds. These people argue that when you claim to be objective, you're actually just preferring your ways of knowing over other ways of knowing, and preferring your version of the truth over other people's versions of the truth. This is a huge oversimplification, of course. Brilliant scholars have devoted their entire careers to this problem. You can find more information by looking up constructivist and postmodernist philosophy. The opposite of that perspective is called positivism, which means that yes, there is an objective reality, and yes, by using the proper methods, human beings can know that reality. In other words, according to positivism, there is an objective reality that humans can know. Most people in academia have a perspective that is somewhere between those two extremes, but maybe a little bit less positivistic than the average person on the street, just because we spend a lot of time thinking about how we know things and how knowledge works. As a student and scholar yourself, you should be aware of where you find yourself on this spectrum. How objective do you think human beings are capable of being? If everything might be at least partly subjective, what are the implications in terms of who gets to define what is knowable? Who gets to define what is important? Who gets to define what is real and what is true? Despite the fact that absolute, pure objectivity is probably impossible for human beings to achieve, striving for objectivity and using methods that help us transcend subjectivity is one of the most important values in academia. Objectivity is one of the things that distinguishes scholarly sources from popular sources. While an individual popular source may try to be objective, not all popular sources have to be objective. But even scholarly sources are not absolutely 100% objective. Authors are imperfect human beings with their own attitudes, beliefs, emotions, and biases. Often they do creep in through and can compromise the objectivity of the information source. That is what you need to be on the lookout for, and that is why you need to attune yourself to the difference between an objective claim and a statement of opinion, and further break down objective claims into ones that are really well grounded in evidence versus the ones that are incorrect or unsupported. Please take some time to visit the supplemental resources link that is listed on the video information page. You'll find some links to videos for the suggested activity. Watch some or all of the videos and as you watch look for examples of objective claims, examples of incorrect claims, examples of claims that are inadequately supported by evidence, and examples of subjective claims or opinions. This is good practice because it's what you need to be doing automatically as you read or watch every information source that you use for research. The Supplemental Resources page also has links to other websites and videos on this topic if you want to study it in more detail. In the Supplemental Resources page you'll also find a link to a very short self-quiz. When you complete the quiz it grades itself and it will tell you what you got right and wrong. It will also explain the answers to any questions you got wrong. When the quiz is completed, you will have the option of downloading or printing a certificate, which you can use as proof that you went through this video if you need that for one of your courses.